All right. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to another Live at 945 here on this wonderful Thursday evening. My name is Adam Van Ward, and I am the host of this evening's episode. Uh, if you have never tuned in to Live at 945 before, this is a live interview question and answer series that I've been doing with a bunch of different people throughout um, the scale crawling segment of our hobby. And so in doing that, I've interviewed people from all different backgrounds and all different um, areas inside of the hobby as I could have. Um, oh yeah, Steve Martin says, remember, uh, Facebook loves when we thumbs up and thumbs down or uh, smiley faces, hearts, all that stuff. And that's sarcasm because uh, he said, remember, it freezes and it does. Uh, Facebook really doesn't like when you thumbs up, thumbs down, whatever all that stuff is. So comment away. But um, if you can keep your emojis to a minimum, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about a couple other things. Um, if you haven't followed any of my stuff and you're just happening onto this, check out Van Ward Customs um, on Instagram, check it out on Facebook, and check out my YouTube channel because every live interview that I have done, I have re post-recorded it and then bumped it over to YouTube for an easy place for you to source um, all of that great information that is available to you from all of the great guests that I've had so far. Uh, this week, especially, I'm excited because I have a guest on who I have followed for an extremely long time. Um, since I got into this, basically, uh, the, our guest today is a phenomenal um, scratch builder. He does great body work, great paint work, um, just, just great all around, crazy good stuff. Um, Sorry, I'm reading comments like I say everybody shouldn't do. Uh, it says, what if we thumbs up in the comments? Thumbs up in the comments all you want, guys. Uh, just don't, th don't hit the emoji buttons. I don't know why. Facebook really doesn't like it. Um, all right, so a couple more housekeeping things before we get this thing started. Uh, first off, if you haven't been a part of the show before, please keep it PG. I just ask that you kind of police yourselves and go from there. Um, I haven't had to uh, kick anybody from a feed, and I don't want to have to start tonight. Additionally, um, I have a couple of other interviews coming up in the future. I have locked down an interview with James Knight, and I've locked down an interview um, from Knight Customs, sorry. And I've also locked down an interview with Tom Asher from Three Brothers RC. If you don't know who those people are, go check out their stuff. It's pretty awesome. Um, and we will get this thing fired up. I'm going to bring on James, um, Mr. James Heath. He is well known um, as Crazy Good Builder, and we're going to have a conversation. All right, getting ready to talk. I'm sure I'll have to run over there and change my speaker. Actually, I'm going to do it now, hopefully. Hey. Hey, how's it going? Good. Yep, speaker as always. All right, let's try it again. How's it going, Adam? Now it's too loud. Hold on. <laughs> uh, all right, now I think I'm good. Um, yeah, so for some reason, I can never, ever get that right. And if you've seen this show before, you absolutely know that that's the case because it's literally a weekly thing. Um, no matter if I play music ahead of time, try anything ahead of time, the volume's always wrong. So anyway, <laughs> um, welcome to the show, man. I'm glad to have you on. Uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed our little short conversation we got to have last night as our test um, to make sure everything would be up and running. And uh, if that was any indication as to how tonight's going to go, it's going to be amazing. And all these people tuning in are going to be excited. So. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed it. Yeah, me Easy too. Talk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's start this thing off with tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, uh, man, I basically, I'm from Kentucky, moved up here to Southern Indiana, I sell cars for a living, have for the past 12 years, and I'm uh, just a huge automobile enthusiast, every aspect of automobiles. I mean, from uh, building full-size trucks and selling them, obviously, you know, and right down to the little stuff, you know, so I'm just all the way around, I just thoroughly nuts about engineering and uh you know how things work and like i said automobiles in general so yeah uh, big part of me huge part of my life really <laughs> yeah i'd say at this stage of the game uh definitely like you work 
you work at a dealership, correct? And then you've got this going on yeah. on the side. So it's pretty much pretty much wraps around 24-7? Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, so how long have you been in the hobby as I'm trying to fix some weird lighting stuff I got going on? Well, uh, it, my mom got me into it. I was probably 16. And uh, uh, believe it or not, it was my mom. She was trying to get me to make sure I stayed out of trouble and whatnot. And so uh, she took me to the hobby store, Hobby Town, USA, down in Mayfield, Kentucky, back in probably 1996 and yeah. bought me my first Traxxas. Yeah. And uh, so a uh, Traxxas Bandit is where it all started. Nice. Back when they had the mechanical ESC and all. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that was before me, so I, I have no experience with the mechanical <laughs> ESC. I've had a bunch of people on the show who've been like, yeah, back in the mechanical um, speed control days, and, and uh, I did not have that blessing, so I, I don't fully comprehend that, but I'm guessing it was interesting, to say the least. Yeah, it might be more of a curse than a blessing, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so if you weren't in RC, what do you think your hobby of choice would be? Uh, well, for sure, I, I enjoy working. I've got an old uh, 1950 Chevy truck that I've done a lot of customization to, body work and, you know, metal work and, um, you know, suspension, et cetera, engine work, interior. I, so I really enjoy uh, building that. My dad helped me a lot with it, and uh, my youngest daughter helped me out quite a bit with it as well. So uh, that would probably you know, what is already one of my side hobbies would probably be what I would do, you know. <laughs> I'm really doing what I, I like to do, you know. <laughs> yeah, and, and so I find that a lot when I ask, when I ask that question. Usually, uh, most people respond with, yeah, I do this other thing as well, and I would just do more of that. So yeah. it's an interesting yeah. question, to say the least. Um, so you definitely kind of have your your own um, build style. It's very scale oriented. So I have to ask: Are you a big tire person or a small tire person? <laughs> well, you know, I was thinking about that question, and uh, I'd say for the most part, small tire when it comes to the crawling aspect. But overall, I'd have to say both. Uh, I like to build hot rod trucks and cars and whatnot, and so I like big tires on the back and skinny tires on the front, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, for the most part, I'd say small tire. I'm a small tire guy. I like the, uh, you know, your 1.9s, and uh, every now and then, depending on the build, you know, I'd like a 1.5, but yeah, um, that's about it. All right. Um, are you a brush or a brushless fan? Brushless, all the way. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a, for me, it's a no brainer. I mean, the performance is there is, uh, I don't know. I just, I, I prefer brushless, you know, I know you can get performance out of brush systems. Don't get me yeah. wrong, but, uh, <laughs> I, I see you Todd, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, like I say, I, I prefer brushless myself. Yeah. Um, I, I like brushless. It's where it's at. Uh, I do, I do have to say though, after running some, um, other people's nice brush setups that, that low end piece, if you're going to be, um, doing any like competition type stuff is real nice. Um, but all my, my competition stuff is brushless anyway. So. Oh yeah. My, my, everything that I, you know, yeah, I love the brushless setups. I mean, I've got the low end control and, and yet still got the wheel speed, you know, to the, yep. you know, to the point where I've been in on some court, you know, we're ran in some courses where I didn't even, didn't even use the winch, you know, the wheel speed would balloon the tires enough to get me out of a bind, you know? So, uh, I love, uh, I love Brussels. So. Yeah. Uh, what is your favorite part about RC? The build, uh, by far, uh, I enjoy, looking at something and you know or spotting something and, and getting the inspiration to build you know something that's different new that uh you know that maybe you've seen before but maybe you put a spin on it or uh you know even something that like i said you actually have any yeah build out of oh, aspect of it as far as 
Oh, yeah. I, uh, I like to, you know, my nephews, I've got a, a few nephews, and uh, uh, some of them live up here a little closer to me, so I get to spend a little bit more time with them. But, um, you know, we all, I will, uh, we'll all go out and run the trucks and stuff around, you know, and they got buggies and whatnot. Of course, I've gotten them over the years for gifts and what have you, but right. uh, short of that, you know, like I said, the build, I like to build them. Yeah, I mean, you can kind of see it peeking by the shoulder over there. So I, I like the I like the little hints you've got going on, kicking around like right in this area. <laughs> um, so let's let's start talking a little bit about that. So uh, over the years, you built some pretty wild stuff. Um, that that Vuck that goes around all over the place, the van truck. Um, that's yeah. changed hands a few times, and I know that originated with you, I believe. Um, and so yeah. then. Some of the veterans in the hobby probably know you from, like, having the title of Chop Shop. Um, mm -hmm. Can you elaborate a little bit on, on that, how it got started, and then, like, where your styrene skills came from as a whole? Well, basically, uh, I, I had a few friends that were on the forums uh, back to the uh, RC Basher forums you know, around 2010, somewhere around there. And then, uh, you know, we got to building trucks and cars and what have you. And they seen what I was doing with mine and asked me if I thought I could customize one and maybe do some custom paint. And I'd already been doing a lot with models and what have you and since I was a little kid. And so, I, you know, it was something to try. And yeah. so uh, it turns out I was pretty good at it. So then I started having, you know, a couple more requests. And uh, then I found RC Crawler, uh, you know, the forum. Yeah. rccrawler.com and uh found that forum and then i think i joined it around uh june of 2011 or something like that and uh um started building them yeah but i'd only built a couple and then i started to basically i wanted to become a vendor on there and so i paid my dues paid my hundred dollars and um came up with the chop shop as a name you know i thought it was yeah. something different and you know cool and uh so I started doing body work for people and uh, paint work and, uh, you know, I'd customize, uh, you know, I'd take a clod buster cab and another one and turn it into a crew cab and do drop beds and dove noses, dovetails. Um, gosh, I did LED light kits. You know, I got a guy that was selling me kits and I was, you know, uh, wholesaling them basically. <laughs> and, uh, um, styrene uh, cal induction hoods for clod busters and what have you and mm -hmm. um, you know it just kind of spun out of control for a few years it just kept doing more and more builds and uh, so it, it was uh, it was a lot of fun though I met some pretty cool vendors and uh, worked with a few different ones I got hooked up with Locked Up RC of course uh, Matt Lass with Rat Boy RC um, you know, night, night crawler, 3d customs, you know, he's a pretty cool guy too. I've talked to him quite a bit on Instagram and whatnot, but, yeah. um, you know, shoot Todd, all those guys up at the guru compound. I mean, there's a lot of people that I met through RC crawler that, uh, turned out to be some pretty cool guys, you know, uh, Derek, a bunch of these guys, you know, so yeah. hell you, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people you meet in the hobby, you know, all came all kind of stemmed from RC crawler for me. So, right. And so, uh, you had a bunch of stuff kicking around on RC Crawl, and we're going to hit on that just a little bit later. Um, there, there was definitely a thread that I, I had followed pretty heavy because it was really interesting, and I kind of want to bring that topic back up here in just a second. But I want to shift to the side for a second and um, back up. So you did a bunch of custom builds for people. You did a bunch of custom stuff, and people were paying you to do it. But what was your first styrene build? And so I want to pose that to anybody out there um, who's watching as well, whether it be now on Facebook or later on YouTube. Um, what was the first thing you actually built? Oh, uh, well, as far as built and not just modified, because a lot of what I did was taking pre-existing bodies and modifying them, you know, to make what I wanted, whether it be a crew cab or, you know, a dove nose yeah. or whatever it may be, you know. Um, the first true all styrene build that I did was probably a 29 two-door sedan. Uh, I built the rat rod that I've sold um, to Dan on here, and uh, um, that one I built 100% from styrene from scratch using nothing but I had a, my dad and I had a 29 two-door sedan that we were going to build, 
And so I used it as motivation basically and um, yeah. drew patterns and transferred that to styrene and then just started layering and shaping and contouring and sanding and, you know, next thing you know, I had a, a body. <laughs> right. Time to build around the body, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I'm, so I'm doing the thing. I was I see... the <laughs> yeah, I, I'm doing the thing I'm not supposed to do and reading all the comments and got lost in them there for a second. So <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> um, so uh, let's let's. Uh, so we backed up. Now let's jump forward. At this point, you're a pretty experienced uh, builder. How many trucks slash would you say you've built? So you can include like the customer stuff where you modified things and so on and so forth. But to this point, like. How many like fairly involved build, builds would you say you've actually done? I, you know, uh, I, that question, I, I went back and kind of counted, you know, to the best that I could, you right. know, of course, uh, all of my threads, I, I went back and tried to see what I could find in my account on uh, RC crawler, but I can't even find him. But, um, but nonetheless, I, we averaged it up and it was around anywhere from 145 to 160 in that range and uh that was that would include you know my own builds you know builds that i did for other people right um you know, and that's been since like i say running 2010 so you know a little over eight years now right i mean you do the math on that that's still a ton of builds in a year <laughs> You, know, you, you gotta think you know when whenever i'm whenever you get to where you've done one project when you've done one body so many times oh, yeah. uh, you get quick at it you know there's none of this you know looking around head scratching at it you know wondering and worrying about cutting these bodies up and all this you know you just it it's um you get the, the vision you just right. look at it yep that's where i want to cut it you measure it you cut it you know there's none of the uh, messing around really uh, and so right. what, what would normally take someone you know who's taking you know two forty dollar bodies and cutting them in half and trying to glue them together straight and make it look like it's supposed to and right you know and then make a drop bed and you know a cab back to where the body's separate from the bed and all this other stuff you know someone who's going to that extent you know it may take them months to build something like that uh, but once you've done it so many times you know it gets to where it takes you two weeks no, I, I totally get it. Like the, the second time you do something, your speed increases. So I'm guessing like the 20th time you do it, like it's lightning fast. So, well, yeah. And like I, I said the other night, I've got patterns, um, from doing so many clock buster modifications, I've got all kinds of styrene patterns. And so when I have another one I was needing to do, I just will pattern out, draw it out, cut it. There was none of that, you know, having to line it up and, and try to fit it and all this, it was already done. Yeah. So just draw, draw the pattern, cut it out, go to town, you know, so it, it really cuts down on time. So the, in the years that I was a vendor on there, you know, I cranked a lot out. <laughs> yeah, no, you, I mean, you must have like that. That's, that's a lot of builds. So. And that's what it was, Eric, uh, you know, they're talking about the, the threads on a lot of those builds. Uh, whenever I lost my vendor star, because it got to the point where I got burned out on it, it was just, you know, so yep. uh, there was just much of it. Yep. When I got to the point where I got burned out, I dropped my vendor star. And so part of the agreement on RC Crawler Forum, you know, you drop your vendor star and your threads go away. Right. Uh, so, right. you know, all the, over the years, the, you know, all the builds that I did were, you know, the, my vendor name, whatever you want to call it, was involved. Those disappeared. So, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, that photo, that photo bucket went to the dark side. You know? <laughs> yeah, it didn't help the forums at all for for any uh, for any intensive purposes there. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about um, some tools that you use. Like, do you have some favorite tools? Maybe something that like you found that isn't a standard tool that like everybody would be using. That you're like, I do. I use this thing that's different, but there's a reason like do you know what i'm saying oh yeah i know what you're saying uh let's see i've got a few actually i've got a few um one of my 
one of them, and you know, a lot of the body guys use these, uh, is simple files. Yeah. You know, you've got, you know, your round files, needle files, you know, what have you, flat files, um, you know, wider flat files that are a little, you know, a little more coarse and what have you. Um, these right here are excellent when it comes to doing body work on these hard bodies. Uh, there's no, there's nothing like getting a flat edge, you know, when you're needing a line that's straight, you know, or that you don't want to seem to be seen, Right. then uh, these files are, you know, excellent when it comes to that. Um, another one is this uh, speed ball. It's a speed ball cutter. I don't know if you guys can see it or not with the focus, but uh, it's a speed ball cutter. And basically what it is is it's got a little V-notch blade in it. Mm -hmm. And that V-notch blade, whenever you're doing paint and body work on these hard bodies, you get paint down in the lines for the doors and the windows and what have you. Yeah. So you can take this speed ball and just slide it right through those lines, and it digs all that paint and dust and, every, and filler and everything right out of the lines. And uh, on top of that, if you're doing, you know, a custom styrene build where there are no lines. Right. Draw the lines out. This right here will, will dig out that nice little groove. And, and and once you get good with these, you know, you can keep it nice, nice and uniform and steer it how you want or what have you, you know. But yeah. It's a, speed, it's a speed ball cutter is what it is. And you like to say, you, you can find these at Hobby Lobby. Mm -hmm. uh, short of that. The only other thing are these uh, these little dental picks. These are really really good. Um, I'll use these if I'm trying to place a small piece of styrene. Yeah. I'll put a touch of glue on the end of these dental picks just to drop and touch that styrene with it, and then I can hold it and place it where I need to until it'll sit, you know, to where it stays in place. Yeah. So these right here are real handy for getting the little pieces into places where you can't really reach with your big fingers, you know. So. Yeah, I always wonder how other people do that. I used the end of like uh, like my X-Acto knife for my, my knife. So either, yep. either I'd tap it and so it'd cut in just a touch or I'd do what you're saying. So. And that's the next thing is a good X-Acto knife like this orange one here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got a contoured rubber handle instead of just the round, cheap, hobby, average knife, you know. These right here, you have... I mean, complete control over that blade. And yeah. so these are these are really, really worth the investment. They're not cheap, you know, but they're not super expensive, obviously. But right. these are good. So yeah. that's about it. That, that and a cricket, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're getting there. Hold on a second. So um, let's talk about uh, what are some of your favorite glues that you use? And then we're going to transition into another piece after that. But uh what brands, what types of glues do you like to use? Um, well, I got, uh, let's see. I prefer this BSI. Um, I like the, uh, the purple, the yeah. uh, medium gap filling. This right here is probably some of the best glue on the market, in my opinion. Uh, you know, uh, Mythbusters used it to pick a car up. <laughs> uh, you know, we picked a station wagon up using this stuff. So, I mean, you know, if they can pick a station wagon up, it'll hold a toy body together. <laughs> and uh, on top of that, uh, the accelerator that they make to the BSI accelerator, uh, because I'm impatient. And yeah. So, so uh, I, I'd never had used it until like one time I was at my local hobby shop and I went, man, these glues take forever to set. What can you do? And he goes, try this accelerator. And I went, Oh, um, sold. <laughs> After that, I'll, I'll buy accelerator forever. Like it, it just oh, yeah. the process yeah. up so much. So, yeah. uh, so I like to use, uh, I like to use the BSI product and, uh, uh, Tanak 7R or bonding, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, I know a lot of guys make mech, you know, out of, uh, you know, mix pieces of styrene with mech and make a little glue or, or, you know, a putty almost with that stuff too, you know, yeah. but, um, and uh, E6000 uh, okay. or shoe glue. Yeah. But in either either one of those. Yeah. And yeah, it does make the glue brittle. That's the truth. It does make the glue brittle. Um, it also heats the glue up quite a bit too. You know, whenever you spray it on there, you'll notice the, the uh, CA glue does get pretty warm. Yeah. Uh, 
you can almost see smoke coming off of it. So <laughs> yeah, sometimes it gets incredibly hot. I definitely know what you're talking about. Um, yeah. So let's. You shared some of your favorite glues. Let's talk a little bit. So one of the things that I kind of latched to and paid a lot of attention to, and I'm not sure how much of it's still there or not there. Thank you, Photo Bucket. But um, at one point, you had this killer thread on RCC that talked about which glue you would use for which application and why. And so, I mean, it was it was a pretty sizable thread. But can you kind of like summarize that up for people who are maybe just getting into building or yeah, um, experimenting yeah. with the various glues and like what application yeah, is best yeah. for each one? Oh yeah. Uh, E6000. As you can see, I, I keep quite a bit of this around. Uh, <laughs> E6000 is, uh, I mean, it's the MacGyver of glues. I mean, it'll hold anything to anything. Uh, metal on metal, plastic to metal, brick to metal. I don't care. It'll hold it. Uh, you know, it is the end all. It's flexible. Um, you know, it, it does shrink whenever it cures. Uh, so that's something to be, be aware of. You know, if you've got um, two thin layers of styrene that are sandwiched and, and glued together with uh, E6000 or shoe goo, it, it will uh, shrink to the point where it'll actually cause that styrene to wave. Okay. Uh, you know, it's, uh, basically, like I say, if you don't want it to come loose <laughs> and you still want it to have a little flexibility to it, then, uh, E6000 or shoe goo, something to that effect, those are really good adhesives. Uh, yeah. um, another one is a uh, Loctite, uh, I think it's called go to or something to that effect. And, uh, it's really good as well. And it's flexible. And there again, it also kind of shrinks up whenever it cures too, mm -hmm. but um, you know, typically in a, in a, you know, if I'm, if I'm doing body work where I'm trying to join, you know, two butt, two butt ends of plastic, uh, usually what I'll do is I'll use, um, you know, the Tanax 7R or the bonding on the edges of the plastic where I'm actually attaching, you know, the body panels themselves. Yeah. Um, then I'll follow up with a little bit of uh, CA glue and some styrene, some thinner styrene that'll kind of, you know, kind of contour to the plastic back there. Uh, you know, I'll kind of follow up with that on the body and use the CA glue in, that, in there. You know, the CA glue is going to give me that strength to kind of help hold things in place in essence. Right. Um, you know, whereas the bonding, you know, or the uh, so Tanax, you know, whichever you use, either of those are going to bond that plastic together, you know, those two body panels together. They're going to bond them together. But it's, it's not what I would call, it's not going to be as strong as it was from the factory. Right. Okay you can't melt that plastic you know well enough in my opinion now there might be some people who disagree but you can't melt that plastic well enough with a chemical like that to get it to actually bond and, and to where it was like that seam was never there uh you know your average person can anyway some you know some adhesive experts or whatever might be able to but your average person can't and so <laughs> So, you know, on the outer panels, you'd use your bonding or your Tanax 7R, then you'd follow up with a little CA glue and your styrene on the back side of the body panel. And then typically I would follow up with just a real thin smear of your uh, E6000 or your uh, shoe goo uh, to around the, the edges of that styrene, you know, on the back side of that seam right there. And that kind of um, caps it all off. You know, if, right. if you are on the trail and you're competing with this hard body, you're on the trail, you know, you've done everything you can to hold that plastic body together. But if something happens and you roll it over or smack a rock in the wrong way or what have you, and it does manage to crack where that seam is, you've still got that shoe goo or E6000 on the backside along with that piece of styrene back there to kind of help hold things in place. Uh, yeah. at least until you can get off the course, put you a little more CA glue in the seam right there, stick it back together and let it ride, you know? There you uh, go. So, so that's kind of the process. And that's kind of, you know, like I say, each glue, it's, it, one was more brittle than the next. Uh, one has got a little bit more flexibility, you know, obviously than the next. And so it's just a matter of choosing which glue it is that you need for your application, really. Right. Um, you know, and it's just been with building a lot of bodies and, uh, you know, building them myself. I've got a little course out here in my backyard and, you know, yeah. going to competitions uh, and, uh, you know, obviously customer feedback as well. You know, um, you start to learn what kind of works and what doesn't work. And, 
Uh, so over the years, that's just kind of what I found. And I was having so many people ask me, uh, you know, what, do, what do I use? What would you, what do you think, you know, et cetera. And so right. I, I did the thread on a RC crawler and, you know, to kind of throw it all out there for anybody who was interested in seeing, you know, Right. And, and it was great because as someone who was starting to build stuff, it was, it was an awesome resource to be able to pull from and be like, Oh, well, Hey, like that all makes a lot of sense. That would hold my body together. It's pretty helpful. So, <laughs> sorry. Comments again. They're getting me all, all night tonight. Thanks a lot for guys <laughs> commenting. Jeez. Uh, anyway. Um, so we talked a lot about a lot of stuff. I want to take a break and admire some of the stuff you've got sitting around that you've been working on. Um, That's, that's what I'm after. Well, let's see. This is the, uh, it's the Apache that I've been working on here. Yeah. You can see some of the detail work on the engine in there and what have you. The dash in place and, but uh, so last night, you know, I worked on the uh, the racing harnesses and the, the yeah. helmet, the racing helmet, and uh, the shifter boot and all in here, you know, and that kind of ties into the cricket, you know, the ring around the shifter boot in here, right? Uh, you know, as well as the floor mats down there. You know, I used, uh, I printed out the, some, uh, uh, Simpson stickers for the, for the racing harnesses here on the computer last night as well. Yeah. Uh, so, on the, uh, then on the engine, you know, I've got quite a bit of detail done on it. Yeah, you do. <laughs> I love it. Uh, Headers are my weak spot, so I haven't got the headers done just yet on it. <laughs> but like I say, the uh, the fan on the the engine here is a, it's a fan off of a uh, uh, Mamba Mons- Mamba Max Pro ESC mm-hmm. cooling fan off of it. I cut the blades off of it and made my own blades out of a. Uh, aluminum flashing and then uh, mounted the fan to where the fan would go on the engine and I've got the wires hanging down here so that whenever I hook it up to the ESC I'm gonna try to wire it up to the ESC so that it speeds up with the engine you know yeah if nothing else I'll just wire it up to where it runs constantly but uh, the the fan blade spins on the engine there too and so uh, you know it's uh it's about everything on it has been customized or um, you know, custom made one way or the other. Right. Um, you know, the, uh, the little, the Chrome bumper up here, you know, that kind of ties into one of the things that anybody building a uh, custom vehicle needs. And that's one of these Chrome markers. So these Chrome markers are, uh, right here, these liquid yeah. Chrome markers, these things are nice. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, I've, seen, get those, I've seen some people use them, and they they get a good finish, man. Oh, uh, if you if you uh, as long as you let it cure long enough, you like to like well, you can see it right there. I mean, you get a nice chrome finish. Uh, but yeah, I've been working on the the gasser build. Uh, you know, I've got a uh, let's see. I don't know if you guys will be able to see it or not, but I did a uh, did a matchbox, kind of a replica of the old truck that I'm building. Yeah. So, uh, so I just saw a comment, chrome marker, mind blown. Um, for people yeah. out there who maybe don't know about the chrome markers, can you like hit them up with a brand name or something like that, so that if they're looking for it, they can they can find one. Um, let them know what's yeah, going it's on. Yeah, Molotow. It's a Molotow. Uh, well, I can't get the focus on it. Molotow Chrome Marker. Liquid Chrome is what it is. And uh, they make them in uh, three different sizes. I believe they got a four millimeter, a two millimeter, and then a one millimeter. 
And uh, it is, I mean, by all means, if you're doing custom body work or anything like that and you're going to be painting and you want realistic looking chrome, go get one. <laughs> yeah. I'm telling you. Uh, whenever I saw, I think I saw Scott Limpert, I believe it was the one that mentioned using a chrome marker and I thought, man, no way. There's no way the marker can look like that, you know. Yeah. And uh, I spotted it at Hobby Lobby and, you know, they're like $11 and change a piece. And uh, I spotted it at a Hobby Lobby and uh, I thought, man, I'm going to roll the dice. I'm going to go ahead and buy two of these things and by far worth the investment. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. It, it's chrome in a marker, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the nerd, you know, the, the RC nerd slash side of me, whenever I started using that thing, was like, holy shit. <laughs> There's this chrome coming out of this marker. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's crazy. Uh, it's amazing, like, what's out there now that that's, that's accessible. Like, um, even with weathering stuff and, and so on and so forth, I picked up some stuff that I haven't gotten to try it yet. But, man, I, I did, like, a test panel, and it looks really good. So I can't wait. Yeah. Um, There's how, some cool stuff out there. Oh, yeah. yeah. How do you find a truck to build? Where does your inspiration come from? Um, uh, you, you've you got all this different plethora of, of styles of different things. Like, where does that come from? Well, usually it comes from either seeing one, uh, you know, in real life or uh, running across one on the Internet, you know, um, or, you know, it might be one that I own myself or, you know, someone close to me owns, uh, you know, I'll see it. And then, you know, next thing you know, I'll, I'll run across, uh, a part or a body or something that just calls to that particular build. And then it just kind of spins in my head, you know, I get to thinking about, you know, yep. well, I could do this, do that. Next thing you know, yep, I'm committed to the build. This is what I'm going to do. And so it, it kind of all just stems from spotting something, you know, that just grabs my eye. Uh, the current gasser build that I'm doing, you know, I'm using a bright green metallic paint for that and yeah. gold, gold metallic paint and gold leaf and, you know, just kind of everything bright, gaudy and over the top. And, uh, you know, that kind of, it all stemmed from me cruising Instagram and uh, I saw a, a green 50, you know, 1950-ish model a uh, Chevy truck that was a gasser and it was the lime green, you know, chrome everywhere, just flashy over the top. And it just really caught my eye. And uh, I, it just, I just said, I want to build one. And so, <laughs> you know, uh, I happened to run across a Nightcrawler 3D Customs and, uh, you know, he's doing the 3D printed bodies. And uh, he, I'd mentioned, you know, he had mentioned, you well, you ought to build one, you know, use one of my bodies. And so, I got with him and I got this 58 Apache Chevy truck from him, you know, and decided to roll with it, build a gasser. So, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the whole 3d printed thing. The, at this stage, this is kind of your first 3d printed build. So what would you say are some of the pros and cons to starting with a 3d printed body or like building from scratch? Um, is it, is it similar? Is it different? Like, uh, what is your thought process on that? Well, well, I mean, for the 3D printed body part of it, you know, it's not for a beginner. Uh, you know, if you're if you're seasoned, if you like to, you know, do paint body work, you're good with filler and sanding, a lot of sanding. Yeah. Uh, you know, or if you're not afraid to use a Dremel on a, an expensive body, you know, if you're just not afraid to dig in and go after it, uh, then 3D printed bodies are a massive time saver. Yeah. You know, not everybody can look at a flat sheet of plastic and, and see, you know, a 19 Chevy, uh, you know, a 1989 Chevy truck like Donnie Brandon built. Not everybody can look at a flat sheet of styrene and see that truck. Right. You know, got the vision, you know, to, to and not only vision, but the patience and, you know, uh, commitment to go through building one of those just out of a, a flat sheet of styrene, just a, a flat sheet of place of paper. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, so not everybody has the, the, uh, the vision, you know, the, like say the skill set to take a flat piece of plastic and, and turn it into something cool, you know, that they want, you know, a truck or what have you, you know, 
And so, styro, you know, that's where your 3D printed uh, bodies, you know, uh, have a huge advantage is because your average Joe can buy one of these bodies. And, you know, if he's good with a little, uh, with a sanding block or a Dremel or what have you, then you can have something one off custom, you know, and, uh, you know, so it's uh, 3D printing has changed the hobby uh, so much. I mean, it, it, you know, it really started to get huge around, I, I guess, about 2014, mm -hmm. 2013 in the hobby, somewhere around in that range, you know, it really started to get big. Right. Obviously, it took off before that, you know, but around that time was when it was starting to get more affordable for your average Joe to start selling 3D printed parts. And so, you know, I, I noticed it as a vendor on RC Crawler, you know, that yeah. a lot of things that I was doing were, you know, scratch built or one off, you know, now the person could just buy it 3D printed, you know, so, uh, you know, it, it, like I say, it's, it's for your average person, you know, you can take one of the, a 3D printed part and, and with a little sanding, you can get all the ridges out and what have you, you know, and uh, a little uh, primer filler. Uh, is a godsend whenever yeah. it comes to 3D printed parts. Uh, and so just a little patience and you can have a really, really nice piece out of it and with a lot less work than with styrene. Yeah. Um, uh, I can see the benefits there for sure. Uh, if, you've, if, if you're not someone who's ever tried to attempt to build something from scratch, like the amount of time and head scratching that goes in uh, to your first time doing it, that time and energy isn't there if you're doing the 3D printed thing. Um, that's all been done for you. Now you just got to make it look good where you'd have done all the time and energy and still had to make it look good because you've stacked and layered and uh, you have rough corners and stuff like that. So, yeah. Right, right. Absolutely. Um, let's talk a little bit about a process that I've not seen anybody else do and I've seen you do, and I was like, when you posted pictures of it or uh, whatever the post was, I was like, yeah. I'm going to buy one. Like, I, <laughs> I went and priced up. Like, I, so you're printing, you're, you're 3D cutting with a Cricut on styrene to do some building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I can't even say more than that. Like, what? <laughs> where to come from well, explain this process tell me how to do it so that when i get mine i can do it <laughs> okay well basically uh it, it stemmed from me needing a gasket when i was putting the engine in my old truck you know i had to make one instead of buy one just because the price the prices on them were so high but uh basically you know i um I'll get online i'll find uh you know whatever truck i'm building i'll find a picture of that dash Mm -hmm. And so once I find a picture of that dash, I'll try to take away some of the layers, so to speak, uh, of detail. And so, you know, like uh, on your dash, I would take away the knobs. I would take away the, the actual gauges, but the out, leave the outline, you know, of the, you know, just kind of take these away in my mind. And then if I could on uh, paint, actually, I would just draw out the basic shape of what I wanted that dash to be uh, with the lines. And yeah. so... Once I had that drawn out, then I could save that to the Cricut program, you know, Cricut Design Pro. And then uh, I would use that whenever I'd put the, uh, you know, the mat in for your Cricut. You know, you got a, a, a green mat that you adhere, yep. you know, whatever your vinyl, fabric, cork board, cardboard, card stock, whatever it is that you're using. Right. And so then I just stuck vi uh, the styrene to it instead of the vinyl or what have you. Uh, you know, it, it, only, it doesn't like, you know, 0.40. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> point 10, point, uh, you know, 20, you know, those are okay for it. And, uh, you put it on the heaviest setting, uh, you don't have to go to custom, you know, but you can go to the heaviest setting on it and it'll actually, uh, the blade will come down, it'll cut once it'll pop up, come down and cut once one more time, you know? Yeah. Uh, so it, it kind of double scores each, each cut. And so, uh, I did a piece last night to show you. Awesome. So on the, uh, on the dash that I did for the uh, 48 willies. Yeah. Okay. So I, I basically drew the outline of the pieces that I need. And then I put it in the, uh, the Cricut design space. And then it gives me a template. It gives me an outline of the dash. Yeah. 
And so then once I got that, then I'll just start popping more pieces out until I'm left with either, you know, just the outline of the dash. You know, you take out the gauges and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then as you see, as you keep going, you know, you keep taking more and more details out, more layers away, if you will. Right. And then so I'll then would stick this once I've got this kind of picked out like I want, you know, for the dash detail, then I would take this and I would glue it to a thicker sheet of styrene. Mm -hmm. And then obviously, you know, that gives it some strength so that I can work with it. Plus, it gives me that background layer because after I've popped out, you know, once I popped out one detail out of this that I'm left with, you know, a cavity there, yeah. and, you know, and so, like I said, it adds one more layer and, uh, you know, styrene, you know, scale building, well, kind of ripped it, but you can kind of get an idea. It creates a, a, a gap there, if you will, in between those two pieces of styrene. Right. And so whenever you, whenever you sandwich it with one from the back, then it creates another layer of detail. Mm -hmm. And so basically I would just keep doing that. You know, I, I did one layer on it. Well, then I needed the rings that went around the, the light switches, you know. So there again, I went to the Cricut and I pulled up a, a circle or made a ring, you know, and I cut that out, on, out of styrene on the Cricut. And yeah. so then we would just take that ring and place it wherever I needed to on the dash. And then as you went, you know, you just take different files, different sanding sticks, uh, which they sell at Hobby Lobby, the sanding sticks. I really like those. Yeah. And uh, you can sand at an angle and kind of contour everything to where you've then got a detailed multi-layered dash. You yeah. know, so then it's just a matter of, you know, whether it be heating it up uh, to get the bins right or... Uh, So like on this dash here, mm -hmm. get the focus right. On this dash, whenever I did it, there we go. Basically, I had to cut out the first layer, and then I could affix each layer until I finally had the shape and you know the contour of the dash like I wanted it. And, right. Uh, you know the start the uh, the cricket really helps out with spacing and making sure everything is evenly spaced across there and uniform and uh, you know not to mention you can cut your you know you you create your uh, labels you can use a, a label to make your gauges. Yep. Well, and then you'd know what yeah. size to print them too because if you printed through the cricket every every space where you have a hole for your gauge you i mean you know exactly what size you have because you just right. pull it from that file um exactly yeah I so whenever I needed, when i needed to cut the the dash you know for the the gauges i already had the the triangular shape you know for that hole all, all i did was on this program you can weed out all the rest of the image and leave just that and right. so then i just used that as a template i same deal. I put that image in. I had it to cut my clear styrene, you know, for the lens for the dash for the dash there. Yeah. And then I also put it to cut the shape of the gauges, you know, to make sure everything was scaled, you know, and right size and all. So yeah, it's very very handy. Yeah, I I would think, and so for someone like me who is not a fan of precise measurement and all of that stuff, I as ridiculous as it sounds on the computer, I have no problem doing that. In real life, when you put it in my hands, that precise man measurement, like the cricket would be highly beneficial for me in that aspect, for sure, in that regard. And so this is the, this is your cricket here for anybody who doesn't know what it is that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so like I say, that's, that's what a cricket is for in case anyone doesn't know what it is that we're talking about. We're talking about this cricket that cuts things, you know, <laughs> so, right. uh, yep. you know, it's basically just a, uh, a machine that cuts vinyl for you. So, yep. Yeah. So, uh, like I said, this is one more way to be able to utilize the stuff that's out there now and manipulate it in such a way that you can use it for what we're doing. And it's intuitive. I like it. I'm super pumped that you did it because I would have never, ever in a million years thought to do it. And so now in the future, I can steal that idea. So thank you. There you go. There you go. Um, so let's talk about 
how I, I know that now using the cricket for the precise stuff is nice, but how precise do you get in your measurements or are you kind of like a build it big, shape it back kind of guy? Well, uh, <laughs> I, I'll, I use, uh, I do measure quite a bit, uh, but a lot of times whenever I'm making something, if it's something that needs to be uniform on each side, you know, I, I'll make a template out of paper, I'll fold yeah. it in half to it, and then I'll cut the overall shape that I need, lay it out, draw it out, and cut it. Uh, there's times when I eyeball something and just use my fingertips, you know, uh, to line it up. It depends on the situation, you know. Yeah. It's kind of the, the heat of the moment type thing, you know. <laughs> if it's something where I, I'm just hell-bent on getting this one particular detail done, then, you know, I very well may do it just by judging with my fingers. But uh, most of the time, though, I'll, I'll measure it out, mark it, and glue it in place here or what have you. So. Yeah. So I have to respond to a comment because I'm laughing like internally right now. It says live at 945 brought to you by cricket. Uh, so any yeah, corporate right. sponsors that want to sponsor live at 945, go right ahead. Um, I will totally be sponsored by cricket. I have no shame. Yeah. Then one hey, over hey, here. Don't, 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 I'll talk don't forget the plug now. Don't <laughs> forget the plug. Send one over here. I'll talk about it all the time and uh, I'll use it. <laughs> uh, no problems. Um, so anyway, back to what we're talking about here. Uh, what is one thing that you'll never leave off of a scale build? Oh, man. Uh, the color red. <laughs> <laughs> no, Eric will get a kick out of that. He thinks I paint everything red, which I, prob <laughs> I probably do. But, uh, no, I, well, yeah, I mean, the color red. I like a little chrome on just about anything I build. You know, I like a little bit of uh, something to pop. Uh, that might be keys in the ignition, which here lately has been my, you know, one thing that I really enjoy, you know, um, you know, I'll throw a pack of cigarettes on the seat, you know, just some kind of odd little just detail right off in the blue, you know, and, you know, that's what I like to do on just about any build that I do. And, you know, I like it because whenever, you know, uh, you know, a family member or a personal friend or what have you sees it or someone online, you know, sees it. And it catches their eye, you know, that little detail catches their eye, you know, uh, you know, and it just, you know, to some people, you know, it, it makes them smile, it makes them laugh, you know, and so uh, it, I like that. And so, you know, and uh, like I've got a, I've got a K5 Bronco build back here, uh, one that I've had for several years now. And uh, there's, you know, there's some pieces of trash in the floorboard, empty, you know, and each one actually, uh, each one kind of ties to someone in the family that, you know, uh, uh, it's funny because, you know, they always leave trash in the car and they always leave trash in my truck and stuff, you know, when I get onto them. And, and so, you know, with my daughter, it's usually candy wrappers. My mother-in-law leave cans or what have you, you know, I mean, it, it's just, this is how it goes, you know, but, yeah. uh, so, you know, in, in that truck, in that K5 blazer, you know, there's a, you know, I've got a little miniature Reese's package rotted up in the floorboard and a, you know, an empty Coke bottle in the floorboard, you know, or, a, you know, an open ashtray with a, a cigarette in there with a little smoke coming off of it. You know, you can use cotton, uh, yeah. you know, to make a smoke effect off of it, you know, and so things like that, that's the type of thing that I'd say I wouldn't be able to leave off of a, of a scale build you know right yeah no those are the tiny intricate details i've never ever gotten that far um i'm lucky if i can like <laughs> i'm lucky if it has a dash and a whole interior and like um a little bit of scale going on uh so let's uh i've seen a bunch of stuff like i love the k5 i love the k5 you talked about it and pointed behind you somewhere do you have the availability to kind of pull it down and talk about it real quick or yeah yeah. All right. So it's a uh, basically it started out as a uh, clod buster. Yeah. And, uh, I filled in the hood on it, filled in the roof on it, cut out the whole bed area, cut out the back of the cab. Uh, I used a dash from Jeff Daughtry and uh, put that in there and backlit the gauges and added a key, added keys in the ignition, you know, ashtray with a cigarette in it. Yeah. Um, 
the trash in the floorboard, of course, the, uh, you know, the quarter stick shifter, the hearse shifter, and the Ryan Luna 3D printed the uh, uh, door panels for me, and I finished those up and put them in. Uh, I made the uh, racing seats and harnesses there, which I made a set of harnesses last night using just a few pieces out of the jewelry section at, of uh, Hobby Lobby and some thread, you know, and uh, basically back here underneath the uh, electron, that's where all the electronics are hidden. Yeah. I would have never guessed that panel just popped out of there like that. That's that's yeah. smart. That's someone who's built a bunch of trucks and knows that when you build a custom truck, you better build a custom way to get to the electronics because it's going to be rough. That's right. Uh, well, uh, custom crawlers, uh, license plate on it, and uh, my buddy MJ Durstein, uh, this bumper back here, he made this for me probably, gosh, it was back 2000. 13 2014 he made that bumper for me to go on a uh, defender build that i did uh, but i got the grill uh from uh, german cuts i think is what it's called it's a uh, you can every now and then you can find them on uh, ebay but not very often and um you know it's kind of a late 80s blazer kind of grill there you know and uh, the front bumper was custom made by uh, Scalar Fab, uh, mm -hmm. Loft Assist <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, uh, They made the he made the front bumper for me on this one, but uh, it's got the dinky split skid. Uh, I'm running a Rock 412 in here with Mama Max Pro 3S under overdrives. Yeah, beef tubes, old school beef tubes. Big beef tubes fan. <laughs> uh, I got the pro the uh, power stroke shocks on it, you know. Of course, locked up RC bead locks, locked up RC uh, trail ready uh, rings, and uh, scale hardware all throughout. You know, the whole thing's covered in scale hardware. Uh, right. Old school DMG rear truss on it. Uh, I cut the rear axle housing out, and then uh, used an AR60 axle housing uh, diff cover for it. That's an interesting. So, that's a nice touch, man. That, that yeah. little like that little piece that go in that extra mile you didn't have to cut it out but you did it anyway so oh yeah yeah all the lights light up on it i cut the uh the tail lights i cut them out of the clod buster body and uh used some clear tail light lenses in there and backlit them with leds of course you know so all the yeah. tail lights light up on it and uh it was a really nice high gloss finish on it and then as i was driving it you know i kept getting scratches and dings and what have you here and there and so as i started getting scratches i got this uh it's this uh, mixture from i think it's like uh, great pyramids uh it's a rusting effect and okay. so as i was getting the scratches in it i was putting a little bit of this rust effect stuff in each little scratch you know and then it would rust and so then it started to look like you know little scratches and little surface rust and whatnot from over the you know from the time on the trail so right uh, but yeah this is uh this one right here is it and i'm not sure about uh, today's sorka rules but at the time <laughs> when i built this and leading up to a few years ago it was class one sorka legal and uh the one time that i did run this one at a competition was up in pennsylvania and at the, uh, the east coast scale challenge mm -hmm. and uh that was i think like maybe a week two weeks after i finished built it uh building it uh, i ran it up there and, yeah. I, and uh, it was uh i think it was like 11th or 12th place i took up there uh using this truck so that was a you know Pretty, what I felt was pretty dang impressive with the, with the caliber of competition <laughs> that it is, you know, and the oh, first time of really getting this on the rocks. But uh, so, yeah, this is uh, uh, Mike Wiegand, uh, Speed Wiegand, uh, several years ago, he made this little light bar. It's really, really ultra thin. And uh, so then I used some JK, uh, you know, VP mounts to, to put the light bar on there. And, no, I uh, dig it. That's a good look. Fire stick from Super Shafty. Uh, got Super Shafty sh uh, gears, or not gears, but top shafts inside the dinky uh, transfer case. And all that's all Super Shafty. And 
I've got it geared up pretty tall. Uh, I've got a lot of low end control with it, a lot of low end control, but uh, it's still got enough wheel speed that it'll catch air running across the yard for sure. There you go. <laughs> oh, it'll pull a wheelie and flip over on its roof, but you know, <laughs> so uh, I'm a fan of wheel speed, but yeah. Uh, sorry. Yep. I'm right there with you, man. Gotta have some wheel speed. So I built that one, and then I got into minis. So then I turned around and so then I got into minis and I turned around and built a mini me version of it. Right. That's awesome. And it's, uh, you know, it's basically the same thing only in one twenty fifth scale. Yeah. It's looking pretty spot on from here. <laughs> you know, the, the cargo, well, it's kind of hard to take out on this one, but the cargo area comes out the same way to hold the battery underneath. And, yeah. Uh, you know, it's obviously a little hard to match up the wheels and whatnot. They don't make them for that size <laughs> from locked up, unfortunately. But, <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, then I turned around and made this little replica of the, uh, of the K5 there as well. Yeah. Nice. And all the, ga the, the, day the, yeah, ugh, I'll get it out in a minute. The gauges on the dash, the shifter, all that, you know, the uh, the CB radio that's in here, the light bar up here on the top of it, every bit of it all lights up. All the, all the lights on it all work on this one as well, uh, just like they do on the one-tenth scale. Um, yeah. So uh, it was a, a labor of love. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, man, that's that's small. By the time you do all of that and try and put all that electron, all those electronics in there, and make all that stuff work, that's that's a tight package. So, oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Um, so I have to ask, who are some of your influences in the scale crawling segment of our hobby? And if you were picking someone to be on the show, who would you pick? Oh man, uh, Scott Limpert is a beast. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he never stops. I, like, I'm just going to throw it out there. <laughs> he is a beast. Uh, you know, I mean, just about anything he builds is awesome. Uh, you know, uh, Noob, of course, you know, anything Noob builds is awesome as well. Uh, I see I see a few guys on here that are uh, – uh, there's one guy that says his name is uh, uh, Alaska Eric. Okay. And I spotted him on, you know um, – well, on some of the scale side, you know, groups or what have you on Facebook. And uh, he built some really hyper-realistic trucks. And, uh, you know, I, I've been kind of looking around uh, at those type of things. And so it's hard for me to say, you know, if you could get Alaska Eric on here, that'd be cool. <laughs> well, I, I wrote the name down. I haven't run it. You know, okay. yet, you so. know, you'll, you'll, he spells it E-R-Y-K. <laughs> I can tell you that much. <laughs> Uh, you know, like I said, uh, some of the, I, I see a lot of photos and whatnot of trucks that he's built and they are just hyper realistic. Yeah. Um, uh, and, you know, of course, Scott, you know, <laughs> get him on here again. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I, and you I, know, I, I'm, I'm not opposed to bringing people back. And, and so that's one of the things that as, as it's gone on, like, um, it, I, I genuinely am looking for people to bring on and I'll send a message to anyone. I can't guarantee that they're willing to come on and, and chat, but um, I, I don't have any problem sending messages to people and seeing if they want to join. So there you go. <laughs> so, all right. Um, what is your favorite build out there that has come from someone else? It's not yours. It's just out there floating around the internet. Uh, what's the one that's caught your eye? Uh, there's two. Uh, one of them is uh, new. Uh, he is working on a 3D printed uh, Toyota Pathfinder right now. And it is a uh, Toyota blue. And uh, he is just doing an, a beautiful work with the body work on that and the paint on it. It, it is just stunning. Yeah. Uh, but then uh, also on top of that, uh, Donnie Branham with his, uh, his Chevy truck, you know, that, that old late, that, late eighties Chevy truck, you know, I, that thing has just turned out really, really cool. Yeah, and, uh, the power wagon that he's got going on right now, you know, I, I've got a soft spot for, I, you know, I'm a huge <laughs> Chevy fan through and through. Uh, but that's, that power wagon is pretty tough too, you know? 
Um, but you know, I, I've seen a few, you know, Scott Limper, man, he absolutely kills it with his, uh, with his builds and has for years. Yeah. And, uh, so, you know, like I say, it's tough to really say <laughs> those guys <laughs> right there are really, really doing some nice work. Yeah. Um, and the, and the, the tri van that you did, you know, the tri van that you did, you know, that thing turned out pretty damn cool too. That's not something you see all the time, you know. So yeah, it's it's different. That's that's my style. It's just got, I can't build something everybody else has. I I I don't want to. Um, and so uh, the one thing I don't do though that I wish I did more of is the more like hyperscale realistic stuff, like putting those tiny little touches in. Um, I just get so impatient at the end. Like if I, if I throw a build together, I'm like, that looks good. Let's take some pictures and run it. Like I, I can't, I can't wait. I can't wait for the little details. So it yeah, you, you got to man. It's uh, <laughs> you, you get to where you see it, what I call a C in scale. Yeah. And so when you're looking in a store, you know, and you see a little, you know, if you're going for some glue or something and, and you spot a little, you know, a little piece of something in the jewelry section that looks like a door handle, yeah. you know, well, then that's, that's your snowball, you know, right there. It just started. And, you know, your next thing you know, you're putting a little chrome door handle on there and, and you're thinking, well, I could probably do one on the inside. That would look pretty cool too, you know? And so now, <laughs> boom, well, now I need a door panel if I'm going to do a door handle. So it, it, it just snowballs. And the next thing you know, just a simple dash isn't enough. It's got to be backlit. It's, you know, and then it needs keys or it's, you know, it just keeps evolving until next thing you know, what would, you know, you build a truck and call it quits in a few months. <laughs> next thing you know, it's a year and a half. <laughs> you, know, you, you spend, you know, several, you know, 10, 12 hour nights staying up all night working on something just because, you keep thinking, well, this next level, you know, there's one more detail, you know, uh, you know, this right here would look cool. And all oh, while well, this is dry and I'm going to do this. And, you know, so yeah, uh, it snowballs. <laughs> no, and I get it and I understand and I, I'd love to, but man, recently, like in the build department, things just haven't, haven't been coming together for me. I tear them apart. I get ready. I have good intentions and then they just sit. So yeah. one of these times I'm going to, put everything back together and make a nice build i've got i've got a couple of really interesting projects waiting in the wings but they're not they're not together by any stretch of the imagination so we'll see what happens um so let's talk about budget stuff you i mean you say like I, when i look at your gasser there there's so many details there's so many one-off things there's so many things that you've purchased and then manipulated to be something else do you have a budget or how do you approach that part of it basically if i can't if i can't buy it uh if i can't buy it without having to worry about pulling out of the family budget so to speak you know yeah um if i can't buy it without having to worry about pulling out of that i'll paint something you know i'll get a job I, uh, right now i've got a body i'm fixing to do where i make turning an rc blazer you know rc four-wheel drive blazer into just a short bed truck and doing some paint work on it you know to get a little extra funds to apply towards this gasser build that i'm doing right now you know right um but, basically the budget is as cheap as I possibly can. If I can't buy it at what I think is a reasonable price, then I'm going to do something to where I can afford to buy it. If it's something that I need that I can't seem to find or, you know, like for the front tires or the back tires or well, pretty much anything else on this gas or build, <laughs> you know, anything that I've needed on it, I haven't been able you know, you can't just buy uh, right. You know, I need I need a set of gas or tires for a 10 scale RC. You, you can't buy that, you know, so you have to make it. And right. so through trial and error and a lot of tires thrown in the trash, eventually, you know, I get to where I can cut tires into and widen them or narrow them or what have you, you know, and, and manipulate them to be what I need it to be. Right. Uh, and so a lot of the budget comes into play when, you know, if I've got something laying around, that's my go-to. I've got I've got a big work area down here that we built, you know, just for this hobby. 
Yeah. And I'll get a lot of drawers of, uh, you know, scale items, you know, parts from models, you know, things that my mother-in-law's given me from yard sales that she drags in uh, yep. to, you know, if I spot something that, you know, I think's cool at a flea market or what have you, you know, it goes in one of these drawers. And so if I need a, a cool part for a custom build or, you know, or if I need something that's one off. I'll pull in my resources. I'll look in my drawers, see what I've got. If I've got something I can modify to make what I want, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, and, you know, it, it's, I like the fact that whenever I can point, whenever I so, show somebody the truck, whether it be online or in person, because, right. you know, like I'm huge into automotive field. And so I know a lot of people that are, are also automotive enthusiasts. And so they enjoy seeing the hot, this side of what I do. Right. You know, from, from knowing me from the car sales standpoint. So, you know, whenever I show them something like this, you know, and I can say, you know, hey, the, I, you know, I'm, I modified this, I modified that, I had to change this, this is this, you know, that that brings a little bit of pride in what you're doing, you know. And so that's where a lot of it comes from. It comes from necessity. You know, invention is born out of necessity. Right. And they don't make the narrow tires just like I need for the front of this gas or truck. So I'm going to make a set. Right. You know? And so, um, you know, they didn't, you know, for the, uh, the, uh, gear reduction unit I used in this truck, they didn't make a mount for something like that to go to a SCX 10 skid, <laughs> you know, it's for an airplane. <laughs> and so you got to make that, you know, and, right. and, it comes from the time, you know, and some people who've been in it from a lot longer than I have can tell you when you needed something for this hobby, they didn't always make it. And so you couldn't just always buy it off the shelf. Yep. So you, you look for something that you can make, manipulate, turn into what you want, um, you know, and so you, you get to where there again and, you know, you, you, you need that part to get the look that you want and the only way to get it is to make it. Right. And so that's one of the things that kept me going with the tri van is that the rear, that whole rear setup wasn't a thing. And so the trial and error, yeah. the, the searching it out, the, I mean, Oh my gosh, hours of online research to figure out how in the world I was going to make that rear wheel drive because right. uh, they couldn't just oh, be two I watched. Front. <laughs> they couldn't just be two I'm wheel drive in front. Like it wasn't okay. So but I know what you're saying that it, that was probably one of the cheapest builds I've ever done because it was all made because you couldn't buy exactly. it. It was a requirement yeah. to make it. You didn't have a choice. And and so that was also why it was fun. And and I think exactly. sometimes people get intimidated by making something or to yeah, take on that yeah. process of making something and it's it's okay to fail i can't tell you how badly i wanted it to be belt driven in the rear and i i have well over a hundred dollars in belts that are just sitting around because i tried everything under the sun like everything i didn't want to go to a chain and i gave up and did it but you know i've got the perfect belt for you actually <laughs> <laughs> Well, where were you? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, it, it's it's something you know. Like I say, it's not a, you can't just you can't just buy parts for a tri van, you know. <laughs> no, and when, can. when you're building it yourself, you know, it, it's you don't spend uh, you know a hundred a hundred dollars for this piece that uh, some companies had to spend hours in in making and you know research and designing, etc. You make it yourself. It's usually something that you've either picked up along the way that you haven't got any money in, really, you know, right. or or it's something that you bought cheap that because you know you knew that you were going to have to rework it, reconfigure, you know, attach this, whatever it may be, to make it suit your needs, you know. Yep. And so at the end of the day, instead of buying, you know, uh, the skid that I've got in this blazer over here, that dinky skid, you know in essence, I could have used something like that in this gasser if I wanted to spend another $80, $90 for that skin and all the gears and et cetera to go along with it. But at the end of the day, I spent $12 and used a, a gear reduction unit for an airplane. Right. You know, 
that truck, that gasser is not going to be climbing the rocks and all that stuff, you know, so it's going to be on the shelf for the majority of the time. And if it does see any wheel time, it would be like a car show up at our dealership or what have you, you know? Right. Uh, You're going to be on flat pavement. It's it's not as involved. When you've got limited resources, you apply it where you have to, you know, I'm, there's more money in the body on this gas or truck than there is in any of the rest of it combined. Right. You know, I applied it where I had to for this build. Makes sense. And that's probably the best budget answer I've ever heard. Um, some people are like, I'll just throw the wallet at it. Other people are like, mm-hmm. I operate on a budget. Don't tell anybody I don't. Um, but no. <laughs> no, no, just, uh, yeah. I, I think that out of necessity sometimes, it makes you be more creative, and that's a good thing. Um, I like the problem-solving aspect of it, too. You know, I'm, I'm, like I said, I've always been a big fan of engineering and how things work and, you know, gearing and, you know, servos, moving things, you know, just making something move with the remote, you know. Yeah. And so when you've, when you've built it like that and, you know, you engineered it, you bent the little arms and you did this, you know, and there's a – big sense of pride uh you know for yourself it's, it's a big you know self pat on the back if you will you know that you you overcome a problem you fix something that was keeping something from happening or you know something you've never seen before you know and and you think i wonder if this would work and you try it you know that's a it's a great big pat on the back and that's a big part of the hobby you know is it you know overcoming little obstacles and that aha moment you know and yep. It's the self grata you know, you're just, you're, you're proud of yourself for thinking of it, you know? <laughs> right. You know, and, and this and, is part of any hobby, really, I guess. Yeah. And you should be, you should celebrate accomplishments and you should, you should build on that to um, build skills and then use those skills to better yourself in the future. So, um, I mean, that's just the way that it should work. Uh, let's talk about real quick. So we've talked about like all this complex building stuff and, and all of that. What are you going to talk to? Like, I'm sure that people have sent you messages going like, I'm new to this. I just want to start out. Like I'm barely getting to like into some of the fabrication stuff, some of the body work stuff. What kind of advice do you give those people who are like right on the fence and just getting started? Well, basically, um, the biggest part of advice, and it's a saying I've used on here quite a bit, is it's, a, it's only plastic. You know, don't be too intimidated to take a risk, take a chance. You know, it's only plastic. If you're, if you're thinking, you know, if you've got a body that you found at the Goodwill and, and it's something that, you know, you think, you know, hey, I could probably cut this out and make it into a bed back here or, you yeah. know, do away with these cheesy toy buttons and smooth this out and repaint it, you know, to where it looks cool or what have you, you know, it's only plastic. Uh, cut it out, trial and error will, you know, will we'll basically walk you through it, really. Yep. Uh, you know, everything that you need is found online anymore. I mean, and there's a, there's a lot of builders out here, uh, you know, Donnie, uh, Matt Lass, myself, you know, um, you know, help you. There's a lot of people on here that, have, that build vehicles that, you know, that kind of are, I don't want to say, you know, that a lot of people see them or they're in front of a lot of people or what have you, but there's some people that are online on here that get in front of some other, you know, quite a few people that all you got to do is contact them and say, Hey, you know, how do you do this? How do you, and most people are, are so, uh, in love with the hobby, if you will, that yeah. you, you, you're happy to share, you know, in, you know, like whenever uh, Donnie Branham and uh, Matt Lass, you know, whenever uh, uh, several years back, you know, they were uh, sending me messages on uh, the Chop Shop group I've got here on Facebook. They, you know, shoot me a message on there. Hey, uh, I'm trying to do this, but it's not turning out right. What do you think? You know, what would you do? Or, you know, what should I do, et cetera. Right. And so, you know, it's, um, you, you kind of, spread the knowledge if you you know show people how you've done it and then next thing you know you know donnie brandon was really good at that time anyways whenever he was asking me questions on there but there <laughs> were just you know there just might be a couple things that you get hung up on or what have you 
you know, that I had encountered over the years. And so, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, no problem, man. Just do this, this, you know, we'll try that. And, right. uh, you know, so it, it, just don't be afraid. It's only plastic. There you go. Best advice ever. Um, and give it a shot. So, yeah. all right. I mean, the worst thing that happens, you're going to do a lot of sanding to get some bad paint off <laughs> or, you know, <laughs> Or you mess it up, you know, and next thing it, it, it's uh, you may have to start over, you know. But hey, one thing's for sure, you learned what to not what not to do on the previous one. <laughs> yeah, trial and error. Uh, that's it. It's only plastic. Try it out, you know. Yeah. All right. So I have to ask, where do you see this whole section of our hobby headed in the future here? Oh, dude, uh, I see it going with a lot of. Uh, a lot of the actuators I think we're going to start seeing in some of the more luxury end kits, uh, you know, like a uh, capo, you know, they've got some real, you know, I know you've seen their Jeep and all, Oh yeah. Uh, you know, those things are over the top. You know, they're over the top pricey too, but you know, RC four wheel drive has got some really, really cool heavy equipment that they sell, you know? So the hobby is going into electronics and linear actuators and, you know, uh, belt driven and, you know, um, subatomic micro switches, you know, overkill RC back in like 2000 and I don't know, 12, something like that. They were making these super subatomic auto, a little bitty toggle switches, you know, and, and you just had to use your fingernails to operate them. And I had one in a 48 Willys project that Eric's got now. Yeah. And uh, so, I mean, the, the hobby's going to what I think is going to be a lot of autonomous um, you know, obviously being able to, you know, your smartphone interaction, driving with your smartphone, but I think it'll also lead into being able to control a lot of different features on the vehicles with your, uh, with the multiple channels on your RC, you know, uh, with your receiver, yeah. uh, through your smartphones, you know, being able to open doors, being able to, you know, smoke out of the exhaust, you know, lights, horns, etc. uh, open the hood and, you know, rev an engine, you know. Um, I think, you know, a lot of these things are already out there and, you know, almost all that stuff is, but, you know, I think it's just going more towards the more realistic end of it. You know, that people are spending more and more money on this stuff yeah. and the companies realize that if they put the product out there and it's good quality and it's mind blowing that people will spend the money for it. Yeah. And so the more realistic, the more detailed these, you know, rock buggies and uh, trucks and Jeeps and what have you, the more realistic they are, they know that, you know, people are going to, you know, kind of clamor more towards that. Yep. And uh, so, you know, the sky's the limit once you get these companies involved. Agreed. All right, man, we're kind of nearing the end here. What should we expect to see next from you? And uh, is there anything that I missed that you need to kind of add in here? Um, well, as far as next, I'm going to probably finish this gasser. <laughs> <laughs> I've, uh, I've been practicing with gold leafing and, uh, whatnot. And so, uh, you know, I've been trying to keep, uh, I've been trying to keep a lot of old school aspects in this pro in this little project. And so part of that is that I do want to do gold leafing on it, you know, real gold leafing yeah. and, uh, you know, little things like that, you know, it's just, whenever you start building and scale and you start finding so many little details and aspects that you can add or change or what have you, it's like, what's next. And so versus using a sticker, which I'm not going to say, I may end up having to go back to a, a sticker on the <laughs> side of the truck to get the look I want. I'm not going to, don't let me bash a sticker right off the get right out the gate. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I'm going to try to right. do uh, gold lettering down the side of the truck instead you know it's that next level yeah and uh, so it's uh it's one thing that i haven't really tried I've, I've i've slowly but surely in this hobby i've tried to conquer little things you know hand laid uh, uh fabric carbon fiber uh bolt holes for example i've, I've you know created, like I said, hand laid carbon fiber. Uh, you, I've got fabric rows of carbon fiber and use the epoxy to form it and all this stuff, you know? And so yeah. it's all about the next level. And, uh, so the next level, I think in this case for this particular project, there again is going to be the gold leafing and stuff. And so, um, but once I get done with this, like I say, I'm going to build a, a, a regular cab short bed, 
uh, Silverado truck out of a K5 Blazer, and it'll have a yellow and white two-tone, kind of the old school uh, stock clean look, you know. Yeah. Uh, I'm doing it now for uh, for a guy, Terry. I'm doing that now for him. And uh, so that'll be up on the on the uh, on the board workbench next, so to speak. But awesome. uh, past that, Nightcrawler uh, 3D Customs. Uh, I've been working with him for a little while. I've been trying to get him to build me a 1950 Chevy truck, a 3100 Chevy truck. I've, I own one now myself. It's a, a full size one. Yeah. Uh, you know, my old hot rod I've been working on the past couple of years. And so I've been getting, I've been picking on him to build me or design me one of these trucks, uh, and 3d print it so that I can do, that's my next big project that I want to do. Yeah. As a, a replica of my full size truck, you know, white walls, air ride, so to speak, you know, that type of thing. So. Sweet, man. Uh, I can't wait to see it. I, you know I'll be following. I, I've been following <laughs> for a long time. So, uh, All right. Well, thanks for being on. I had a blast having this conversation. Um, I'm sure that people are going to gain some, some, good, some good info from it. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get to do this again here in the future sometime. So. Okay. That'll be fun. All right. Well, I'm going to let you go and close the show out and go from there. All right. All right, we'll see you later. Yep, see ya. All right, well, that's going to do it for this episode of Live at 945. I apologize for the weirdness that's going on with my lighting. Like, I didn't change anything. I have no idea what's going on. Anyway, back to what's really um, happening here. Check out my stuff on Instagram, Vanor Customs. Um, check out... Uh, Venor Customs on Facebook, check out my website, VenorCustoms.com, and go over to YouTube and watch all of these past videos if you haven't seen them already. 100% worth your time. There have been some great interviews, great information from some awesome guys who are involved in this hobby. Uh, until next time, when I'm going to bring some more people on the show next week at live at 945, uh, I just want to say thank you guys for all tuning all for tuning in. Uh, I appreciate each and every view that goes on, everybody who comes in, everybody who comments. I'm going to go back through and try and answer some of those comments. And if you're watching this later on YouTube, leave me a comment. Um, let me know what you thought. Let me know if you have any questions or anything like that. Uh, but to end things up, summarize some stuff. Uh, if it wasn't for all of you guys tuning in, I, I wouldn't be doing this. And it would just be me talking to a camera, and that is incredibly boring. No one wants to watch that. So until next time, I'll catch you guys all next week. Have a great night.